Perhaps later. You can see this the presentation, right? Yeah, so far. Yeah. Yep. Great. I hope you guys are okay. Uh, so according to my time, is uh, one uh, is now the time to start. So I would like to once again thank everybody to join, uh, and I will join in a minute or two. Uh, yeah, once again, this is the online Spice Spin Plus X seminars that we've been having now uh, since August. Um, and then so this is organized by the Spin Phenomena Interdisciplinary Center in collaboration with the Spin Plus X uh, Collaboration Research Center between Mainz and Castro's Latin. Uh, the talks, as usual, are 3 to a p.m. German time. So today there may be some confusion with some countries not having gone into their winter time uh, yet. Um, Hopefully, you guys can all Google German time. Uh, and then, to, uh, as usual, please uh, write your questions down in the Q&A, where you can interact. And then at the end of the talk, uh, we will uh, go ahead and, um, and give you the, 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 the word so you can ask a quick question. If you cannot, with a microphone, please specify, and I will ask the question for you. Um, it is a great pleasure to have uh, Mark Wittner today. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to speak in German now. Um, he's uh, now been a while at the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen. Um, he has come, uh, he was at MIT doing his PhD, uh, a postdoc in Harvard, and then with an interim period, I think, at Ohio State, uh, he ended up uh, uh, back in Europe, like we, many of us are coming back to Europe. Um, and he has uh, now... Uh, Done a very very nice work that he presented in a previous workshop that I wanted to share with the community here on uh, dynamics and particularly how out of equilibrium uh, states you can obtain uh, that you would not obtain otherwise uh, or manipulate otherwise in an equilibrium format. Um, so with that, uh, we'll not take more of your of the time. Uh, we'll ask uh, to please go ahead and share your uh, your presentation, Mark. And uh, start your talk whenever you like. Um, okay. Can you see Great. me in the screen? Perfect. So go ahead and start uh, whenever you like. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good. Just think, so, first of all, uh, I want to say thanks to Haro for the invitation and the very nice introduction. Uh, <clears throat> just one word uh, before I start. I, I think that uh, it's really great that we have this. You know, global seminar now. Uh, it's it's sad that it took a pandemic to get us to use the technology that was already at our fingertips. But I think it really uh, <clears throat> is transforming the way that we communicate uh, and probably gives a lot more people access uh, and allows us to exchange ideas much quicker than before. So you know, even after the situation of Corona is over, I hope this will you know continue uh, and we'll have you know new ways of communicating like this. So I think it's really great. Uh, that we have seminars like this that are being organized, uh, even when we can't be together. Okay, so uh, given the nature of this SPICE seminar, I thought I would tell a spicy story today, which involves electron-electron interaction, spin-orbit coupling, and, and topological materials. Uh, and I'll explain more as we go along which elements of that and how they fit together. Um, before I begin, I want to just uh, first mention that the work that I'll be discussing was done in collaboration with uh, Ajit Balram, uh, Karsten Flensburg, and, and Jens Poska at the Neil Kaur Institute. Okay, so, so to begin, I wanna just spend a minute or so setting a context for this work and, and discussing uh, some more general phenomena that this uh, work fits into and, and what I think is interesting about it. Uh, so, so the main idea that I'm, exploring, and, and this uh, topic that I'll speak about today is one example of that, uh, is how when we take a many quantum many-body system and, and push it out of equilibrium, uh, various types of internal fields of this system can be excited, and, and those can act back and lead to interesting new non-equilibrium and non-linear phenomena. Uh, so some examples you, you may have heard about or, or can think about, uh, for one, there's experiments by uh, Cavallari's group, seeing how by coherently exciting phonons inside a material that can alter the superconducting properties of the electrons there. Uh, also, um, you can, for example, excite 
uh, AC electric fields, which are associated with collective motions of the electrons inside of a system, say in a plasmon. Uh, and those can act back and give rise to interesting nonlinear plasmonic phenomena, new types of symmetry breaking transitions. Uh, you can also imagine AC or DC currents flowing in the system, which in equilibrium would not be possible, but out of equilibrium, they can exist. Uh, and through various mechanisms, they may feed back and change the underlying electronic properties of the system. And as I mentioned, lead to various types of nonlinear phenomena. So the phenomena that I'll focus on today, one or two of them, uh, that I'll speak about uh, are of this nature. And so as we go along, I want to you know, just have you keep in mind that these are some specific examples, but they fit into a broader context of non-equilibrium quantum dynamics that we can uh, explore in, in various ways. OK, so, so basically, the uh, outline for my talk is that uh, since I will be speaking mostly about phenomena that occur in topological materials, I'll begin with a reminder uh, introduction about topological materials and edge states and, and the parts of it that we'll, we'll need and that motivated partially this, this work. Uh, then for the main part in the middle, uh, I'll tell you about this phenomenon of current induced gap opening in uh, helical edge states of two-dimensional topological insulators. Uh, and then in the last section, I'll, I'll discuss some extensions of this work and, and connections to other works which are, which are out there. Okay. So to begin, let's just recall the Hall effect. Uh, so uh, the Hall effect, uh, as you as you remember, the, the Hall resistance, Rh, which is here, uh, it characterizes how much transverse voltage uh, appears when we have a current that flows in the direction perpendicular to a magnetic field. Uh, and just from classical physics, from undergraduate, it's very quick to you know, sketch out a couple lines and, and see that classically uh, we would expect the Hall resistance to scale linearly with the applied magnetic field. Okay, so that's some kind of reference situation. Now what happens is if we take a two-dimensional electron system, cool it to very low temperatures, uh, and make sure the magnetic field is, is rather strong, instead of a, a straight line, as that classical calculation would have predicted, uh, the Hall resistance features a bunch of steps which are here. Uh, and you know, it's interesting that there are some steps. OK, it's quantum. Maybe there should be some kind of steps. Uh, but the fact that there are steps is not the most interesting feature of this uh, phenomenon. Uh, what's really exceptional about it is that, uh, to borrow some words from Addie Stern, is that these steps that we see here in experiment are essentially the the flattest steps that you've ever seen in your life. Okay, so, so the value of the Hall resistance on one of these steps is so precisely quantized and varies so little over the range of this step uh, that measurements of this quantity can serve as a, as a metrological standard. And the, you know, the value of the, the metrologi metrological standard for resistance is actually based on the value of Hall, resist Hall resistance seen on these steps. And you can see that it's you know, measurable to 10, 11 digits, something like that. Uh, so it's a really impressive phenomenon, the fact that you can take some mesoscopic or even macroscopic electronic device and see something that comes out of it that's as precise as you know, measuring the G factor of an electron in, in outer space or something like that. Uh, okay, so that's an experimental fact. Um, but very shortly after this was observed, there were several key theoretical insights about this phenomenon that help explain why this quantization is so robust. Uh, and the key insight was that, in fact, uh, we can understand this quantization of the Hall conductivity, if I flip it around, uh, as a property of block electrons, as a band structure property, in fact. And not only is it that, but it's a topological property of this band structure, meaning uh, it has to do with the global properties of the wave functions in the band. Uh, and because it is such a global topological property, it's rather insensitive to perturbations. And therefore, if there's disorder or various you know, inhomogeneities in a sample, uh, those won't cause deviations. In fact, in some ways, they, they help stabilize this value. Okay, so that was the beginnings of topological electronics from that point of view. Uh, now, the realization that quantization of 
Hall conductivity is a band structure property, pretty soon led to the idea that maybe we don't even need an external magnetic field to produce a quantized Hall effect. Uh, now, Hall effect is inconsistent with time reversal symmetry, so we'll need magnetism somewhere. Uh, but instead of using an external magnetic field, you could imagine having uh, polarized spin full impurities, so you have a ferromagnetic system, and through spin orbit coupling, that could modify the way that electrons are moving and, and also give rise to a topological band structure, which would give uh, a quantized Hall resistance or resistivity. Uh, and lo and behold, something like 25 years after the suggestion of a model which can realize this quantum Hall effect at zero applied magnetic field. Uh, in this material, which is listed here, we see that there was observed a quantized Hall effect at zero applied magnetic field. Uh, and as you can see also just from the chemical formula without looking too closely, you can notice that it involves a lot of heavy elements, which is good for spin orbit coupling. And it involves magnetic dopants, which is good for getting magnetism. So it has all of those features that we would have expected. Okay, so this phenomenon called the quantum anomalous Hall effect is you know, another member in our catalog now of topological transport phenomena. And in the meantime, between when the quantum Hall effect was discovered and, and the proposal that it could be uh, realized at zero applied magnetic field, Kane and Mele realized that uh, top there are various other ways that block bands in the solid could become topological uh, besides the way that gives a quantized Hall response. And in particular, there are ways that we can find topological bands even when time reversal symmetry is intact. And this gave rise to the notion of the topological insulator or the time reversal invariant topological insulator. And one, one uh, fact that's kind of important to recognize is that the quantized Hall conductivity uh, is, is a bulk linear response property of these uh, quantum Hall and quantum anomalous Hall systems. You can understand it from Kubo formula uh, of the bulk electrons. Now, in this time reversal invariant topological insulator, uh, there isn't any straightforward transport, bulk transport property that is associated with this topological nature of the wave functions in the material. Uh, but there's another aspect of topology which is, uh, does have a close analogy. And in these quantized Hall systems, uh, in addition to the bulk having this non-trivial topology, there is um, a so-called bulk boundary correspondence, which tells us that not only is there some interesting property about the bulk uh, transport, but also we're guaranteed to find gapless chiral edge states that go one way around the edges of the system. Uh, and those edge states provide a nice way in some circumstances for understanding transport through the system. So, so whereas the quantum spin hull or time reversal invariant uh, topological insulator system doesn't have a bulk transport property that's nicely quantized as we have in the other cases, uh, the part that does show through is that there are these very special uh, in this case, helical edge states that are guaranteed to propagate along the edges of the sample. Uh, and they can't be removed by disorder or uh, anything like that, as long as time reversal symmetry is preserved. So, so a key point about this um, time reversal symmetric topological insulator is that time reversal symmetry means that backscattering is forbidden inside the edge state. And the reason that's important is, okay, you might say, well, okay, great. So now I have some one dimensional conducting channels that run along the edges of the sample. Who cares? I can also just have a one dimensional wire that runs along the edge. What's so special? Well, if backscattering by potential disorder is forbidden, then you may expect that the uh, transport through these edge states is ballistic. And if it's ballistic, we should see some kind of quantized transport uh, associated with just two terminal conductance through such a device. And so that was the uh, motivation then for looking for some kind of robust transport properties in this quantum spin hull system. Okay, so, so now we can look 
to experiment. And, and actually it was an amazing feat of both theory and experiment that not long after this uh, theoretical idea was proposed that there could be a time reversal invariant topological material, uh, a specific material, specific chemical compound was predicted and was able to be synthesized in high enough quality to, to observe this effect. And it's you know, quite amazing. Uh, and what you see here from, from the data is that here's uh, as a function of, of a gate voltage measuring the two terminal resistance in, in this topological material. Uh, there is a plateau of this resistance corresponding to two E squared over H, uh, where E squared over H is the conductance you get for each ballistic one dimensional channel present. So if we have a two dimensional sample with one ballistic channel along each edge, we would expect to see two E squared over H. So, so that's observed, but you know, this, this quantization that we see here, I think we'll all agree, uh, is not the flattest line that you've ever seen in your life, uh, unlike what we saw for the quantized Hall effect. And, and also you can note that this is on a logarithmic scale. So it's, it's very much not the flattest line you've ever seen in your life, despite the fact that it's topological and we may have expected all kinds of protection, uh, it's not nearly as robust as the quantized Hall effect. Okay, so this was the initial observation and, and we can fast forward uh, 10 or 11 years and we found different materials that can also exhibit this phenomenon and, and you know, improved quality and all these kinds of things. Uh, and now what we've achieved in these 10 years is we've gone from log scale to linear scale. So that's a good thing, uh, but still it's not the flattest line you've ever seen in your life. Um, Nice thing from this experiment in tungsten detailleride is, is in fact that this quantization, although maybe it's not as sharp as it would be for quantized Hall system, it's observed up to a border of 100 Kelvin. So, so it's a much higher temperature effect than, than before where we were at you know, 30 milli Kelvin. Okay, but what all of this shows us is that uh, whereas the edge states of a quantized Hall system are extremely robust, and in some sense, because of that, maybe not so interesting because there's not so much we can do with them. Uh, in the quantum spin hall or time reversal invariant topological insulator case, these edge states seem to be relatively fragile or to put it another way, maybe to put a more positive spin on it, that they're malleable. Somehow they're, they're, they're more susceptible to being affected by something in the sample. Um, and so there's been a lot of interest and a lot of work has gone on to try to understand in fact, why the quantization isn't as nice as we might have expected it to be. Um, okay, so that's that's a context uh, leading up to motivation for this work. Now, what, one thing I wanna say in front is my goal is not to explain why we don't see good quantization here in the linear conductance. Uh, the phenomenon that I'll describe is actually about nonlinear transport, uh, but sort of the motivation coming from all of this is a, we want to understand better just what affects the nature of these quantum spin hall edge states. Um, and B, just trying to use the fact that apparently, as I've mentioned before, these edge states are, are malleable and susceptible to various types of perturbations to see how can we actually, you know, find some new, new mechanisms through which we can uh, modify those bands in the dispersion uh, in situ and, and investigate the, the effects of them. Okay, so, so that is the background. And now I'll turn to the main focus of the talk, which is on this phenomenon of current induced gap opening in 1D helical edge modes or the edge modes on the, that run along the edges of this two dimensional topological insulator. Okay, so, so as I mentioned a few moments ago, the key property of this time reversal invariant topological insulator is that the matrix element for elastic backscattering vanishes. Okay, and, and what does this mean in a little more detail? So, so this helical edge mode has the property that uh, we have electrons of one spin propagating, say, to the right, and electrons of the opposite spin propagating to the left. That's what makes it helical. Um, and what we see is that if we have up spins, say, as right movers and down spins as left movers, 
then if you would come in with some potential impurity that would try to backscatter a right mover to left mover, then uh, there'd be an orthogonality of the spin state, and therefore this backscattering would be forbidden. And that's to zeroth order what protects this edge mode from having any resistivity in it and why we might have expected to see ballistic propagation. Okay, so now if we think about it for a moment, and you don't think too long because then you'll resolve it again. But if we think about it for a minute, there, there is something kind of paradoxical to this situation, which is we're saying that uh, time reversal symmetry is crucial for protecting this edge state and for giving us some kind of ballistic propagation. Uh, but then if you think about it, you notice that, well, as soon as they have a current flowing, which is the you know, transport property I'm trying to look at, this flowing current itself breaks time reversal symmetry. If I reverse time, the direction of current would go the other way. So, so you know, what the heck? Basically, that was the starting point for this whole work was just this, this idea, okay, uh, so what's going to be the influence of the fact that if I break time reversal by the current, suddenly all the symmetries are, are lost that we're trying to protect this thing. Now, like any paradox, there's no actual contradiction here. Uh, once you, you know, think about it and resolve it. And in particular, in the linear response regime, this doesn't affect anything. But uh, if we look into the nonlinear transport regime, which we'll be focusing on, then we can see the effect of this time reversal symmetry breaking by the current and, and how it modifies the nature of this edge state. Okay, but let's see what this flowing current actually can do to the system. Uh, the issue is that if we don't have any interactions in the system, then what a flowing current means essentially is that we have an imbalance of populations between the right and the left mover. So I'm coloring in the lines here to indicate the filling states. So if I have, you know, now I have right movers populated to a higher level than the left movers, then I'll have, well, net flow of electrons to the right, which means there's a current flowing to the left in the situation. But in the absence of interactions, that's the end of the story. All we've done is repopulate the states in the band uh, and there's no feedback, nothing else happens. So, so to see something interesting, we're going to need actually two, two extra ingredients that I'll be discussing going forward. First is some kind of feedback, which will come from electron-electron interactions. Uh, and the second is that even if there's electron-electron interactions, if spin is conserved, if, there's, if we have you know, conservation of SZ of all the electrons in the system, then still there would be no way for up spins to scatter to down spins uh, because we'll have you know, conservation law that prevents it. So we need to make sure we relax SZ conservation. Uh, and so once we do those two things, we, we see that there's no reason for SZ to be conserved, and we bring in electron-electron interactions, then the situation is going to change quite dramatically. Okay, so, so the first, let's focus on this SZ conservation to begin with. Uh, and the first statement is this, this zeroth order picture of quantum spin hull edge states that there's spin ups propagating to the right and spin downs propagating to the left, that's a bit too simplistic. Um, and more generically, the spin quantization axis that we have for you know, the right movers and the left movers actually depends on, on their energy. Uh, so if we would look at an effective Hamiltonian to describe the one dimensional states in the edge, we may find something like this. The, there's a linear term in K, which they look something like K times sigma Z. So that would give us up spins moving to the right and down spins moving to the left. Uh, but if we go to higher powers of K, we can find other, you know, sigma X, maybe sigma Y all showing up. Uh, and this combination then will give us a spin quantization axis, which uh, say, at low energies, where the linear and K term dominates, we'll find that the spins are very closely aligned to the Z axis. We have up spins going one way, down spins going the other. 
But then as we move up in energy, the spin quantization axis will rotate. Something like that. Uh, but crucially, if I pick any particular energy here, the right mover and the left mover still have exactly opposite spins. So, so backscattering, elastic backscattering is still forbidden. And these are time reversal partners, it, it has to be. But there's nothing that constrains the spin orientation to be in, in Z everywhere. Okay, so, so that's a really crucial point. And, and you know, this effect of Hamiltonian, it's, it could be more general. We could have a spin independent term that's uh, even in K, that's time reversal allowed. Uh, you can have higher order terms. You could have sigma Y unless there's some other symmetry that prevents it. Uh, but we'll take this Hamiltonian as a model Hamiltonian. It has the necessary ingredient that we have an energy dependent rotation of the spin quantization axis. Uh, and now we'll see what are the, the consequences of this. Okay, so, so the next key point in the story of seeing how does a current break time reversal in a way that can break down this quantized uh, conductance is that uh, due to the spin orbit coupling and this fact that there is some locking between momentum and spin of the electrons, once a current flows and we have an imbalance of left and right movers, then there will also be an imbalance of spin density. Okay, so if, if these spins over here are predominantly down, maybe with some slight tilt as compared to these, then we see in this state that's drawn, we'll have an excess of spins along, along the you know, minus Z and a little bit minus X direction. Um, and if we uh, consider a situation of small biases, meaning the difference in chemical potential for left movers and right movers is small relative to the equilibrium Fermi energy, which is here, uh, then to linear order, we'll find that there is a spin polarization that develops. It has a Z component, just like it would have uh, even if we didn't have this lambda K cubed sigma X term, which is proportional to the bias. Uh, and there'll also be a sigma or an SX polarization that develops due to this rotation of the spin quantization axis. Uh, also proportional to the bias, but additionally proportional to this coefficient lambda of the cubic spin orbit term that gives us that rotation. Uh, and for the purpose of analytical calculations and giving simple expressions in the talk, uh, I'll, I'll work in a regime where there's this dimensionless spin orbit coupling constant here, which I've labeled alpha. It's essentially just lambda from this equation multiplied by other constants. And I'll, for all the expressions I show you, I'll be assuming that this alpha is much less than one. So it's, so it's a dimensionless way of characterizing this cubic spin orbit, uh, which if we take it to be smaller than one, simplifies the analysis. But there's nothing specific to the physics, the qualitative physics I'm discussing that requires this quantity to be small. Uh, it's just for convenience of discussion uh, that I'm going to assume it to be small. Okay, so. So once the current flows, now we have this spin polarization, which is you know, mostly along Z with a little bit of X component. And now we can bring in electron-electron interaction and see what happens. And uh, right, the key point is that when we bring in electron-electron interaction, if we think about this interaction in, in mean field level, then uh, we have a spin polarization, and that spin polarization will produce an exchange field. Um, in fact, if we had a ferromagnet and we just you know, stuck it along the side of this quantum spin hole material, we know that the exchange field of this ferromagnet could leak in and say open up a gap in the dispersion relation. It could split the Cromer's degeneracy. Uh, here, something very similar will happen, except it's not the exchange field of an external ferromagnet stuck there. It's an internal exchange field that's associated with the spin polarization that comes from the current. Um, okay, so for the sake of discussion, you can just consider a simple contact interaction, just when electrons are right on top of each other, <clears throat> there's an interaction. 
Uh, and then in mean field level, we'll find that the Hamiltonian is modified to include essentially you know, examen like coupling to the exchange field, which is present. Uh, so let's see what does it do. Um, if we look at these, the predominantly upspin branch of the right mover, since we here have biased it such that there's an excess of downspins, uh, for repulsive interaction, poly exclusion will favor downspins over upspins. So, so that will push up the dispersion for the right movers. Uh, and similarly, the dispersion for the left movers will relatively move down. Um, and what we see is that now the crossing point, which used to be at k equals zero, has moved over. Um, and importantly, the time reversal symmetry that had protected this Cromer's degeneracy, of this uh, exact crossing of levels there, is now gone. This mean field Hamiltonian does not have time reversal symmetry. There's nothing that protects this crossing. So in fact, a gap will open here, proportional to this yield which has been produced. Uh, so, so the levels actually will look something like this. Now we have these two branches. Uh, with a gap between them. Uh, you'd be a little bit careful about what we call a gap. I'm not saying that the many body state of the system is gapped. It's still a conductor. In fact, it has to remain a conductor. Otherwise, the current that supports this state would, would not be able to flow. Uh, but it's a gap that occurs in the spectrum of filled states below the Fermi energy. And uh, spectroscopically, we could access this gap through STM or something like that. Uh, so it's there, uh, but not only is there this gap, but also the spin states as a function of k are also rotated. And we'll see in a moment why that's important. Uh, but before we, we look there, let's just see something about the, you know, the size of this gap. So, so the minimal splitting that we get between the bands over here, this, this gap that opened, uh, it will be proportional to this parameter alpha which, as you recall, was just this basically dimensionless version of lambda, the k cube term, which comes in this form of coupling. It's also proportional to the bias that's applied, or the current, because the current is just proportional to difference in chemical potential for left and right movers. And it's also proportional to the interaction strength. So you see, we need all three of those ingredients. We need this k cube spin orbit coupling, interactions, and the current to flow, and then this gap opens. And this expression here is derived again in the limit of weak interactions, small bias, and smallness of this spin orbit coupling parameter. Again, for convenience, not out of necessity for any you know, physical reason. Okay, so, so that, that's one thing. So we've already seen now that uh, sort of this fragility of the quantum spin hull edge state in the sense that if we, as soon as we actually apply a current flowing through this state, through interactions, it'll naturally gap itself. Uh, so that's you know, one thing, and we could try to access it, say, spectroscopically. Uh, another question is, how does this affect transport? Originally, our motivation was trying to see you know, what, you know, how does backscattering develop? How, how can we get some resistance out of this thing? So, so let's look at that. Um, so key point is that now that the bands are modified, through this mean field, uh, the cancellation in the matrix element that used to be there forbidding elastic backscattering is now gone. Um, and you know, before it was the case that if I just took two states of one of a right mover and one of a left mover at the same energy, then the spin states would be opposite to each other and therefore we had a cancellation. But due to the mean field which is present, also the fact that now, the, at a given energy, the k for the right mover is not minus the k of the left mover because these bands got shifted. There's there's no cancellation anymore in this matrix element. In fact, we'll expect that the uh, matrix element, if we put some impurity in the edge, the matrix element for this backscattering will uh, basically be proportional to the misalignment between those spins, to the angle that comes out between them. And this also is proportional to the X component of the induced um, 
exchange field that we got from this spin polarization. And the X component, remember, was the one that was relatively smaller due to the spin orbit coupling, which had to be present. Okay, so, so now we see that now sort of all bets are off. Uh, the symmetry that was protecting us against backscattering that had told us we should see some ballistic conduction, uh, that's broken and it required us to bring in the interaction and this cubic spin orbit to you know, open up this channel. And now that it's open, we can ask, okay, so what happens, not if we have a single impurity, but say a bunch of impurities in the edge, which we can think of as just some uh, potential, you know, this disorder potential, which is there. Um, and just for the sake of doing a calculation and, and exhibiting the phenomenon, we took uh, delta correlated disorder potential. Okay, so it's time, it respects time reversal symmetry and it's just you know, very short range correlated. Uh, and from that, we can calculate a backscattering rate for electrons in this edge state. Uh, and this rate that comes out just get it from Fermi's golden rule. Uh, of course, it'll be proportional to this matrix element squared since it comes from Fermi's golden rule. Uh, and what we find is that it depends on, again, all those parameters that we needed to make use of this symmetry breaking by the current, which is it's going to scale with the square of this cubic spin orbit coupling strength, as well as the interaction strength and the current. Which is delta mu. So maybe a key a key property of this is that this backscattering rate scales with the square of the current, and that's that comes because first we have to use the current to make a spin polarization. Then that spin polarization has to modify the bands, and once it's done that, then finally backscattering can start. And the bigger the bias we have, the more current it flows, the more backscattering we can get. Uh, and in particular, you see that this will only affect nonlinear transport because as current goes to zero, the backscattering rate also will go to zero. But what we can do is see how does this affect the nonlinear IB of the system. Okay, so, so with this, <clears throat> knowing that we have now this I squared backscattering rate, we can just think about a two terminal transport setup and calculate an IV curve for it. Okay, so we start out with uh, chemical potential on the left, chemical potential on the right. The chemical potential on the left sets chemical potential for the right movers, and the chemical potential on the right sets chemical potential for the, for the left movers. And if there was no backscattering at all, if it's a perfectly ballistic channel, then you know, right movers would just flow across here and this chemical potential of right movers would be flat line. And similarly, the left movers would just all go across and this mu of the left movers would be totally horizontal. Uh, but once this current is flowing and some backscattering is allowed, then left movers can turn into right movers and we'll expect to find some slope. Oops slope of these lines telling us that, say, the excess of left movers that we started with on the right edge, uh, I mean, that density is coming down because they're scattering and becoming right movers, and more and more of them have scattered back uh, as we go along. And the important point of this is that the difference here, delta mu, that tells the current uh, which is flowing through this device. Okay, so, so you can actually go through and just solve the equations for a steady state in this system and get how current uh, depends on voltage from that. And we've done it. Uh, but instead of going through the calculation, there's a nice physical model, I think, which basically shows everything there is to know about it and, and it gets the right answer, uh, which is always a good thing, of course. Uh, and it's basically just a series resistor network that describes this system. Okay, so, so basically, you can understand everything that's going on here. Uh, in terms of this resistor network, that there's first a contact resistance, which gives us E squared over H, the quantum of resistance per channel. Remember, we're discussing just one edge channel right now. In a, in a actual slab of material, there'd be one of these on each edge. So we'd have to multiply by two. Uh, so there's a contact resistance. And then there's a channel 
induced resistance, which scales with the square of the current. And that's the one we got that came from this current induced modification of the band structure. Okay, so, so knowing that we have uh, this resistor network, we can immediately write down current versus voltage uh, in this nonlinear relation here. And there are two uh, relatively simple limits to think about, which tell us the shape of this curve. So the first one is that if this backscattering is very weak, meaning that the current is low, the disorder is weak, interaction is weak, all the different parameters that can control the backscattering rate here, uh, if they're all small and say it's a short channel, then this R induced down here will be a small number compared to the contact resistance E squared over H uh, and Taylor expanding to bring this up to the numerator and using that essentially then I can be replaced by V over R contact, sorry, R contact. That would give us uh, I, which is E squared over H times V minus some number times V cubed. So there's a cubic correction that starts to kick in over here. Uh, in the opposite limit that this induced resistance is dominant, say if you have a very long channel, even if you have weak backscattering, but you have a long distance for it to take over, the induced resistance will be very big, then you know, we can essentially forget this contact resistance and bring I squared to the left. And then we would find that I cubed goes like V or that I goes like V to the one third power. So that essentially explains the shape of this curve and the coefficients that go in here, you can get by just using the formulas for the backscattering rate that I discussed earlier. Okay, so that's the transport signature um, of this current induced breakdown of the quantum spin hole edge. Okay, so that, that's it for the sort of bulk middle section of the talk. And now, now I wanna spend few minutes talking about some extensions of this work and also connections of it to other works which are out there. So, so to begin, you know, there are many ways that interactions can lead to a breakdown of the quantum spin hole effect. And I would be remiss if I didn't discuss at least some of them and place them in context. And you know, there have been many papers and, and you know, many different effects discussed in literature, and I, I won't give a comprehensive discussion of all of them, but I wanted to highlight a couple uh, which are maybe most closely related to what I'm talking about here. Uh, one is that um, once we have this spin quantization axis that you know, rotates as a function of energy, uh, then if we have disorder and electron-electron interactions, then there's sort of an inelastic, there's a two particle backscattering process that's possible. Let's say take two left movers uh, and scatter them into two right movers, such that they go to different energies. It's an elastic process because the total energy is conserved, but each one of them went to a different energy then I can get a non-zero matrix element because all of the spin states are slightly misaligned from each other. Um, and importantly, this mechanism can give a correction to the, the linear conductance. So whereas the mechanism I discussed was about the nonlinear conductance, uh, here we get a correction to linear conductance, though it scales with temperature to the fourth power because you need a phase space of available uh, states for this one electron has to go down in energy, so we're going to have to uh, have some available states down there. We get some temperature dependence out of that. Uh, so that's one mechanism which uses some of the same ingredients. Um, another one which actually makes use of this current induced spin polarization is uh, if you have, say, a quantum dot or some kind of puddle or 
spinful impurity, say it's a quantum dot with an odd number of electrons in it, or some spinful impurity, which is nearby this helical edge, uh, then what the authors in this work noticed was that if you go to very low temperatures, not too low, such that condo screening takes over, but some temperature above that, uh, then essentially the, the current induced spin polarization in the edge state through its interaction with this impurity spin will essentially fully polarize that impurity spin. Uh, and once this impurity spin is polarized through an anisotropic exchange interaction, it can start flipping spins in the edge channel and causing backscattering. Uh, so again, this mechanism actually is able to change the linear conductance. And so both of these uh, could play a role in understanding those observations that I discussed earlier uh, about how in linear response regime, quantization is not nearly as precise as it is for the quantum Hall effect. Uh, there's also been works discussing how when interactions are strong enough, even in equilibrium, uh, spontaneous time reversal symmetry may spontaneously break down and the system may go into two other phases on the edge. Okay, so that's connection to one body of work. Uh, another very recent experiment that I wanted to mention, it's so recent that this paper appeared, I think, last week uh, on the archive, is from uh, Dave Cobden's group in Washington. Uh, and it seems that they have observed signatures of this current induced spin polarization affecting uh, resistance in, in the quantum uh, topological insulator device. Here they're studying monolayer tungsten ditaluride. It's this uh, nice to topological insulator with a large gap where uh, relatively high temperature somewhat quantization has been observed. Uh, so, so what they were doing was looking at nonlinear conductance, but now they're looking at magnetotransport. So whereas everything I discussed so far was with zero magnetic field, uh, their actual motivation in that work was to understand uh, what is this axis of spin quantization at the Fermi energy in their edge state. Okay, so they applied a magnetic field and, and you would expect to see very different dependence in the resistance and whether that magnetic field is aligned parallel to the quantization axis of the spins or, or say perpendicular to it. So they had magnet which could point in different directions and played with the amplitude and also the uh, direction of this magnetic field. Uh, and to measure the nonlinear response, they basically applied some AC voltage and measured second harmonic generation. Okay, so if the IV curve would be a straight line, you would only see the same frequency as what you get by the, what you put in. But if it's curved, then you can see this uh, you know, higher harmonics being generated. Uh, and they were able to interpret what they saw in this experiment in the, the nonlinear part of the conductance. It's coming from the fact that, you know, say during this AC cycle, uh, at some point there's an excess of current flowing to the right. Uh, and that creates some additional spin polarization, which adds as a vector with the Zeeman field of the magnet that's being applied. Uh, and so you could interpret that back in terms of how they already know conductance uh, depends on direction of magnetic field. So, so you can see essentially the effective Zeeman field that the system is seeing depends periodically at the same period as uh, the drive in this case. Uh, and so that gives you know, evidence for this mechanism that I discussed appearing here uh, in the regime where there's a magnetic field applied to it. Okay, so that's... Uh, some context where this physics seems to be already uh, taking place and giving rise to some interesting phenomena. Now, the final extension that I just wanted to mention is that very similar effect to what I described can occur also on the surface states of a three-dimensional topological insulator. So a three-dimensional topological insulator has uh, 2D Dirac modes that live on the surface and they're, they're gapless. And again, this gaplessness is protected by time reversal symmetry. Uh, there's no quantized transport that's associated with this like there was at least in principle for this uh, one dimensional edge channel. Um, but these states are there and they're interesting for a variety of reasons. Uh, and similar to this 
K cubed spin orbit coupling that I mentioned for the one dimensional quantum spin hole edge. There's also hexagonal warping, which can be expected to show up on the surface states of this three dimensional topological insulator. Uh, in the context of bismetallioride, this was discussed in, in paper by Leon Fu uh, in 2009. Essentially, uh, in that material, there's a C3 symmetry. So there's a threefold rotation axis in a mirror plane. And, and basically, just from those symmetry considerations, uh, you'll find this type of uh, effective Hamiltonian for this state on the surface. And it gives rise to these snowflake funny shaped uh, constant energy contours here. Okay, so, so now we can ask what happens if we have a current flowing in this topological insulator surface state, uh, again, following the same kind of logic, when the current flows, there'll be a spin polarization because there's a locking between spin and momentum. And through interactions, that will give rise to an exchange field, uh, which acts as some effect effective Zeeman field in this system. Uh, and what it does in this context, it um, will, as before, it will shift this dispersion where the crossing had been before and also open a gap in it. So we'll end up with some surface state dispersion that looks mm, something like that. Uh, and in fact, in, in that Long Fu's paper that I mentioned, he had discussed how to do this with an in-plane magnetic field. Uh, and so so we rediscovered that similar effect can occur, but instead of in-plane Zeeman field, it's through this internal exchange field that's generated by the current itself. Now, an interesting property of topological surface states that have a gap is that once time reversal is broken and they have a gap, they have a whole conductivity associated with them. Uh, if the chemical potential had been inside the gap, then this would be a quantized Hall conductivity of one half e squared over h. Uh, unfortunately, that's not possible here because we still need this current flowing to open the gap. Uh, but nonetheless, we can get a non-quantized Hall conductivity out of this. Uh, but this non-quantized Hall conductivity, again, will be a nonlinear Hall conductivity, similar to the nonlinear transport we had before. You know, at, in linear response, there won't be any um, any Hall signal, but we will get a nonlinear Hall signal. Uh, so because there has been a lot of interest in other types of nonlinear Hall effects recently, I just wanted to close by uh, comparing this nonlinear Hall effect with another one, which is that uh, in certain materials, there's so-called Berry curvature dipole in the band structure, which exists already in equilibrium. Uh, and although the Hall conductivity vanishes by time reversal symmetry, uh, once the system is displaced from equilibrium, uh, this Berry curvature dipole can be picked up and give rise to this nonlinear Hall signal. Uh, in contrast, this example that I just discussed is one that starts actually with zero Berry curvature dipole. It's forbidden by the C3 symmetry that I mentioned that was there, at least for this bismuth telluride surface. Uh, and in fact, what happens is that in the presence of this current, which breaks all the symmetries, we get a Berry monopole, which forms that can give rise to a different type of nonlinear Hall effect for the surface. Okay, so, so that concludes uh, what I wanted to tell you about. Uh, here's a summary. I think you can probably read it for yourself. I don't need to read it to you. Uh, and I'll be happy now to take any discussion questions that you may have. Thanks for- uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. That was, that was a great and as, as advertised, very clear uh, talk. Uh, I really liked it. I will ask you later on what you're using. It's actually quite nice how you highlight things. Uh, oh, very good. Um, so let's say um, if everybody would like to maybe raise their hands or ask questions, uh, I'll give you uh, allow to talk. So maybe uh, Ross, you have a question for, or maybe was uh, was to 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 think. Yeah? Okay. Let me ask. Uh, I think uh, Vladimir, you have a question. Let me give you the the, the microphone. Go ahead. Vladimir. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. I have a question. Question. Uh, so, sorry. My name is Vladimir Yutsun, 
And uh, I would like to ask you about the stability of the gap uh, induced in the spectrum. What about the uh, excitonic, about the stability of this gap with respect to excitonic coupling of uh, charges from the uh, so-called conduction and so-called valence band, which appear. Uh -huh. Right, okay. This, this goes beyond the mean field, which you considered. Right, th thanks for the question. So I, uh, maybe, I don't know if you, it maybe doesn't matter so much for the sake of discussion whether we take the 2D or 1D case, but you know. Uh, one, well, I mean, I'm in mean 1D case. 1D case, okay, so we yes. can back up to have a picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here, there is this gap. So yes. the important point uh, is that there is a gap in this uh, spectrum, but the, the Fermi or effective Fermi energy is somewhere well above it. So, so all the states near here are already full. Uh, so whether or not we can think about excitonic effects here, it's, it's not so clear to me how to think about it actually in this situation. So, so it's, it's a gap, which is sort of not, a, it's not a real gap in the sense that it's not there uh, it's not a gap at the Fermi energy, but maybe your question, I can rephrase it for myself, maybe is you know, if we tried to look for it spectroscopically and we ask, you know, what would happen if we tried to remove an electron here or here and look for this gap, uh, then there may be some strong interaction effects that may, you know, drastically change what we would see compared to these uh, mean field bands that I've drawn. And that, that's a very interesting question. I, I haven't thought about it, to be honest. OK, and I would like to make a, a short remark concerning the third part. Actually, the, uh, the influence of uh, magnetic impurities uh, on the uh, current was uh, studied in our paper with Boris Altshuler and Igor Alener in 2013. Mm -hmm. And we showed that there should be uh, at zero temperature, there should be just Anderson localization because of the backscattering caused by anisotropic impurities. It's in the one system. Right. In, in the, the one. In the one. Yeah. This is period of 2013. Yeah, on, on this, this, yeah, thank you. That's, that's, that's an important mechanism as well. I should cite this. Uh, uh, Ross, did you have a question or were you just raising your hand to thank for the talk? I'm not so sure. Yes, I was raising my hand. To okay, no problem. no problem. No problem. I'll put you back in the in the attendee mode. Um, uh, let me ask uh, Ali. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Uh, thank you for a nice talk. I have a naive question. Uh, as far as I know, uh, topological insulators are symmetry protected uh, somehow. This means that. Uh, as soon as you break time reversal symmetry, you open a gap in the band structure. Then uh, I understand that uh, when you apply the charge current into the systems, you break time reversal symmetry, but I don't understand why we need the uh, electron electron interactions. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks for the question. Yeah. So let me go back. So, so that was uh, actually that's, that's exactly the point I wanted to make uh, around this, this point. So, uh, it's true that the, the, the degeneracy. Here is protected by time reversal symmetry. So, so you might think that once the current is applied, I've broken time reversal and the gap should open. Uh, but the issue is that uh, if we would forget about interactions between electrons, then applying a current just means filling up these single particle states in, in a different way than they were filled in equilibrium. But it doesn't affect the spectrum itself in any way. Uh, and it's only once we think about the interactions that this altered filling can act back and then open the gap there. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you. But uh, then uh, there is another concept, uh, usually in semiconductors, we have a, a gap renormalization because of the electron electron interactions. But in this case, this is different. Yeah? But it shifts you up and down. It doesn't shift you sideways to find a momentum. Uh, the key thing of, uh, of, uh, of Mark's idea is that it's shifting your momentum from k equal to zero. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes. uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Should, should let him ask it. Sorry. Um, let me um, let me go uh, uh, to Jose. Uh, uh, 
before uh, before Roberto. Jose, go ahead. Uh, yeah, this is Carlos. Hi, Mark. Um, thanks for a nice talk. Um, I'm wondering, um, how do you compare the uh, the effects of disorder or the impurity, as you call it, in the 2D and versus 1D case? Is there a big difference? Um, yeah. So in, in the in the 2D case that I mentioned, which I have fewer really, you know, quantitative results about, uh, I mean, this nonlinear Hall effect. The thing is, anomalous Hall effects when there are impurities are are very complicated because there's all kinds of side jumps and skew scattering that one should should worry about. Uh, the cleanest way to think about this uh, nonlinear Hall effect here in the 2D case, I think would be to do it at some finite frequency. So you could still consider a clean system and try to get around those impurities, but they severely complicate the calculation if you wanna do it and take them into account. Whereas in 1D, it's a relatively straightforward, you know, transport problem uh, there. But that's sort of on the same level that just regular anomalous Hall effect is complicated to describe. Uh, compared to other kinds of disorder scattering. Right. I'm just, I was just wondering about the sort of small angle scattering you know, versus the back scattering that you have in 1D, the protection on this a lot ah, stronger so. than in 2D in this sense, right? Right. And so in 2D, there's not really any protection of any kind of trend. Even in, you know, the linear regime, uh, there's no protected ballistic transport or anything like that, because like you said, you can still have small angle scattering. So exact backscattering is forbidden by time reversal symmetry, but you have all different angles there. Uh, so whereas in 1D, in the ideal case, you would expect something ballistic. Uh, in 2D, even just in the most ideal case, once there are impurities, there's no, no ballistic transport expected. All right, thank you. May, may I? Sorry, I was muted myself. Go ahead. I was telling, <laughs> that was my problem. Sorry about that. May, may I? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Okay. My my uh, nice thoughts. Thanks a lot for that. And uh, my question is kind of related to the to the previous question. And the question is uh, for the three D case or the uh, topological insulator with the two dimensional surface. Is it possible uh, uh, um, to develop a simple effective circuit interpretation as in a 1D case? And how, in that case, uh, if it's possible, how will scale with, with current, the, the nonlinear part? I mean, that's the question. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I, no, I don't have a simple, at least not at hand, doesn't mean it can't be done, but uh, I don't have, such a simple, you know, resistor network uh, version of it. Of course, you can you can look at how the induced uh, gap scales with uh, current. In this case, whereas in one D, the gap induced gap is proportional to current. Here, at least for the model we looked at, it it goes with the current cubed, uh, which is consistent also with I mentioned it in the paper about this. Uh, this metalloid surface, a gap opening due to inflamed Zeeman field, we've seen this also goes like B cubed there. Here it's like current to the third power. Uh, and similarly, you'll have uh, very curvature, which you know scales and you can calculate it in that way. Uh, so at least that's how you know how to approach thinking about it. Uh, the question I was asking is because of course in 2D uh, you, you don't have maybe you can have a exact backscattering, I mean a cancellation of back uh, of um, of scattering exactly back, but then you have a scattering in other directions. So it would be some finite lifetime as well. As well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Nancy, go ahead. Uh, you have to meet, yeah. Yes, there. Hi, Mark. Thank Hi. you for a very, very nice talk. Thank you. Um, so I have, a, I have a problem I am not sure if I understand completely your message because I think there is an issue with self-consistent. So you put your system out of equilibrium by injecting a current and mm -hmm. then you change the ground state. You change the ground state of your system. There is a gap opening because of this breaking of, of the symmetry. And 
but you, you need somehow to have a mechanism to keep the same amount of current flowing through your system. Let's assume that that's the case, that, that you impose that, that self-consistency. Then what are you trying to say is that changes deep below the Fermi surface in the spectra, in, in, the, in the band structure of the system, generate corrections in the conductance, in the linear, in the linear and, and nonlinear terms, the first nonlinear terms in the conductance that, that are observable. Is, is that what you are, that's your message? In an, yeah, exactly. In the nonlinear part, yes. Uh, so, yeah, so. Well, because so we could, I, sorry, go, go. <laughs> so, so I didn't discuss uh, self-consistency. You, you could add that on top of it uh, in, in the case where interaction is weak and these modifications are all small, it, it leads to a very tiny change. We actually uh, looked into it uh, when we were doing this work. Uh, but yeah, exactly. The idea is that uh, you know, once the current is flowing, there are changes to the band structure down here, but not only down there, but the, it's the nature of the wave functions at the Fermi energy, or not exactly Fermi energy since it's out of equilibrium, mm -hmm. but at these energies, the wave functions themselves have changed and the spin states are now rotated. Mm -hmm. uh, that's changed the matrix elements for backscattering that takes us from, you know, elastic backscattering being forbidden to being allowed. Mm -hmm. So this in principle could be generalized to a whole other set of systems that we should start. So the message is you should, we should start looking at the nonlinear terms in, in two terminal measurements, let's say, because those would be reflecting changes deep in the band structure due to the non-equilibrium situation, due to the fact that we are, we are breaking this particular time reversal because maybe the bands at the Fermi energy are not protected by time reversal, but some other bands below are generated by other orbitals, by combination of other orbitals. And then those bands will be affected and then we will have effects at the, at the quasi Fermi surface, as, as you said, at these energies. Yeah, if there's, if there's hybridization between them, mm -hmm. then, then yeah. And you know, I think also it's not necessarily specific to a topological edge state, yeah. mm -hmm. this current induced spin polarization is mm -hmm. pretty generic as long as there's mm -hmm. spin orbit coupling. And mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. You could think lots of different yeah. materials where, where it could show up. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, Francesco, uh, you're next. <laughs> yeah, uh, hello, Mark. Uh, thanks for the talk. Yeah, uh, so uh, I wanted to ask something about, yeah, you you discussed the connection with the nonlinear whole effect discussed by Sotman and Fu, like due to the um, Barry dipole. Yeah. So I believe that, yeah, in a later uh, paper, it was discussed this in terms of uh, like more general uh, three indices uh, nonlinear uh, susceptibility. And basically they discussed that the dissipationless component of this uh, second order susceptibility should vanish uh, in presence of, uh, yeah, for example, C3B uh, symmetry. Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, is the nonlinear uh, uh, whole effect you are discussing here uh, really dissipationless? And if it is a dissipation uh, uh, response, uh, how it comes that uh, it escapes uh, their uh, uh, argument? Mm -hmm. Okay, dissipation listness, uh, I need to think about, but I can comment on the symmetry part of it, which is that uh, because, so, so here the, the current not only breaks the time reversal symmetry, uh, it also breaks the C3 symmetry. Uh, I think it's important that, I think what you'll find is that it's a higher order effect uh, so take high, higher powers of uh, electric fields because we need to break that symmetry that had prevented the Barry dipole from appearing. Uh, I think that's what's going to happen. But but this is actually something. This part is something that's kind of say ongoing slash future work is analyzing this nonlinear Hall effect in more detail. This sort of. Uh, Mm, okay, yeah, thank you, you very much. You've a picture of it so far. Oh, sorry. Huh? Oh, that, that, that's uh, all. I just want to say that, you know, 
Uh, okay. So okay. The thank you. Statement it exists, and then analyzing it in further detail is something that we you know plan to do. Um. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, Seeing line. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for your interesting talk. I have a very naive question. So always, if we want to look for the electron-electron interaction, we look for it when the system has a large effective mass. So do you think this topological insulator has large effective mass and it can give rise to a noticeable electron-electron interaction? Ah, okay, so um, thanks. So, so right, so electron-electron interaction has a big effect when effective mass or density of states is, is large. Uh, the question is which, which density of states should we think about? So, so here, this, this gap that opens, uh, let me go back. Uh, oh, that's not the gap. The gap is here. Uh, and then this alpha also has, has a bunch of, so basically I can say it this way. The, the gap that opens has a lot of powers of Fermi velocity, or basically the velocity that we have for the dispersion down at the linear part. Those are in the denominator. Uh, so having a large gap is favored by having a small value of this velocity, which is essentially, I think, the equivalent of what you're asking about effective mass. Uh, also, in order to have this cubic part of spin orbit be important, since it, its effect grows with energy, it's good to have a Fermi energy, which is, well, either you want a very big value of this lambda, which comes from having very heavy elements in there and maybe some low symmetries. Actually, the values of this lambda are not very well characterized. This is not very much is known uh, about them. Uh, having a big lambda and having a large gap, actually, of this topological insulator gives you more room to have a large value of say, a large gap and and over a wide range of case space would allow you to uh, maximize this term and get as big of a gap as possible. Um, and in terms of numbers, it, it really comes down to the value of this lambda here uh, and gaps and so forth. So, so it, since the value isn't known and we tried to estimate it from some materials which at least have some numerical predictions. Even experimentally, it's not that easy to measure it. Uh, and we think that, say, in this uh, tungsten ditelluride, if if lambda turns out to be favorable there uh, for you know, some millivolt scale bias voltage, uh, gaps in the you know, tens of micro EV could be expected. Uh, but this, you know, this is a lot of further detail about material properties that needs to be analyzed and try to search for materials which are most favorable along those parameters that I mentioned. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, then I have now some questions myself. <laughs> um, so one thing that I'm curious about is um, when you look at temperature effects, uh, particularly uh, looking at the cubic, the V one third term, um, I mean, temperature will give you something similar. Uh, what do you, how would you then recognize so between one and the other? Uh, uh, is it from the time scales or from the path that you have connected to experimentally, uh, have experimentally tried to, 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 to match those? Because for me, when I was looking at your spectrum here, one thing that I don't know, of course, you have the press that may be uh, conducting. Uh, to, to create that current. But if you, for example, did experiments, not so much focusing about the cubic term, but you, you saw that cubic effect and then a dip on the optical absorption at that energy scale, connecting the two. Mm -hmm. uh, so you see that will actually give you a dip on the just optical absorption yeah, uh, directly at that probably for those scales, probably infrared frequencies maybe or close to in between infrared and optical, um, because depending on your Fermi energy, right? But typically on those scales, I'm not sure in those materials where your, your Fermi energy would be relative to that gap. Mm -hmm. And do the experiments together. That would be more of a telltale sign for me 
rather than a cubic term, because I mean, from the point of view that as far as I see, uh, they, that temperature effects could also have give you a cubic effect, effect on voltage, right? Uh, I don't know if it would be, then, then it's a matter of, of, of seeing what the scales would be, like one relative to the other, one would be, oh no, that's way, way ahead at low temperatures or something that I don't know, that of yeah. course would have to be worked out. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, there, there are other mechanisms to get this you know, nonlinear part, as you said, and uh, temperature dependence is one way of seeing. So for example, uh, this mechanism here, yeah. uh, you can replace some of this temperature phase space with right. bias voltage and get also a nonlinear correction to conductance, but it will have a different temperature right. dependence. So that's one way. Yeah. But what I find exciting from your message, from the from the from the from the theory itself of say, look, now I'm showing you that at least spectroscopically in the below the Fermi energy, there will be a gap generated by this current that is going to play a role with electronic interactions or the short grain interactions that you may have. And, and there, I think to, to connect the probe of that cubic part with some absorption that is generated by the current. Mm -hmm. uh, could be quite quite fun to, to try to see if it's observable because that would be the one-to-one. -one. That would be the, for me at least, that, that, that just having heard talk uh, for the first time, that would be a very, very cute, sexy experiment, spicy experiment. Spicy. <laughs> <laughs> no, <I> mean, <laughs> to do, yeah. yeah, that's a great idea to, to, you know, correlate those two things together. It would be, yeah, then, it, then I wouldn't see the, the other argument that to say that's the correct physics, that's the, uh, that's the exact, you know. Yeah, but I don't know, of course, you know, how much of the spectrum it will, it will not, it will be a dip, it will not be a gap completely because of obviously the other parts of the spectrums will be contributing, um, but certainly that there will be some correlated dip um, with the onset of this cubic part. And yeah. there you can actually, because the two are correlated, or there's a fraction as you showed, the one to the other, you could certainly measure that and connect it, I think. That could be a very nice experiment to propose to the yeah. to your colleagues. Yeah, thanks. It's, it's they always like a target. Yeah, this is <laughs> or to prove you're wrong. <laughs> it's like now it's not deep of any kind. <laughs> it's like okay, okay, that's science. <laughs> it's, 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 that's what it is. You know, this is actually I love that. This is the whole point. Yeah, uh, that go back and forth. Um, okay, uh, very good. So I'm gonna turn off here the the streaming in a second. Hang on a second. Uh, end the streaming. End the streaming.